So, good afternoon. I'd like to just be here for a couple of minutes to introduce the co-teacher for this retreat. Uh, I've known Eva and Natanya for about four years when she attended a retreat of mine in California, a Dzogchen retreat four years ago, almost exactly. And then um, I, at that time, was translating, polishing my translation of a series of essays and a Dzogchen text that was published in, as a book called Open Mind. And I knew that she was very educated, had, was completing her doctorate at that time in, in Buddhist studies at the best university in America for that, for that discipline. And I sent her my manuscript and said, maybe you find this interesting. And, and then she found some typos in it. And she asked, could I see the Tibetan? And so I sent her the Tibetan. It turns out her, her written Tibetan is superb. And so then she started polishing the translation I did. And then I found in the, there were seven essays. And then there was a Dzogchen classic by Lerap Lingba, 19th century Dzogchen master, that we'll get to know. And there were passages in that of stage of generation and completion that I didn't really understand, because my focus for the last 30 years has been Dzogchen, not stage of generation and completion. Her understanding was better than mine. And she clarified points that I didn't know. So she be not just not just editing my translation, she was really contributing to it. So she really earned my respect as a scholar and a translator. And then I turned to my next book, Fathoming the Mind, which is a commentary on the great Dzogchen classic of Dujum Lingba. And it has the root text that I translated in commentary. I said, well, she was good last time. Let's try her again. And lo and behold, she wound up really helping a lot with that one, became co-editor of that one. And then I wrote an essay, and you helped, helped me write the essay. It was an academic. I thought, wow, she's really good. <laughs> she's a pretty smart cookie. And so she really earned my respect as a scholar, as, an, as a translator. And now for several years now, um, we're po I've been polishing, reviewing, and then polishing the translations of the three-volume set of Dujum Lingba's classic Dzogchen treatise and Dzogchen. And once again, I'm just finding her, her, her skill, her knowledge of Tibetan is superb, as a scholar, superb. And so she's really earned my respect. And then, but I hardly ever saw her. Those three, first re three years, maybe I spent 10 hours together in three, three years. But it was a very rich correspondence and really a very excellent professional collaboration. Then last spring in Tuscany, where I've been leading eight-week retreats for a number of years now, for the first time she came to an eight-week retreat. And together with Glenn Svensson, who's a very good teacher, student of mine, but he's been an assistant teacher for these retreats, does a marvelous job. If, um, Eva was coming to that retreat, and so I said, well, would you like to be a, an assistant teacher in this retreat? And I said, could you teach this and this and this? And she said, yeah. And so she, and so I'd, I've never, I heard, heard maybe five minutes of a clip of her teaching several years back. I thought she was pretty good. But then when I was getting the feedback from the 60 people in the retreat, uh, receiving teaching from her like what, three times a week? Uh, yeah. Three times a week. Yeah, I just kept on getting these rave reviews like she's really good. <laughs> and I said, oh, cool. I've never heard her teach, but OK, I'll take your word for it. But it kept on coming like she's really, really good. You know, and so I started really developing a trust in her as a teacher that her teaching, the way she teaches, is authentic. If you want to learn Christianity from her, you will hear authentic Christianity, not some fuzzy ways, the New Age version. If you're studying Buddhism with her, I got to trust her. She really will give you the straight deal, authentic teachings. And clearly, she's very effective because so many people expressed appreciation. And I didn't listen to any of them. I didn't listen to one talk of her during the whole retreat because I was doing my own thing. And so she was an assistant teacher there, but she did a superb job. And so, but then after the beat was over, then I listened to some of the recordings. And I thought, wow, they're right. <laughs> She's really good. And then for the last two and a half years, I think, two and a half years, she has been almost nine months a year in full-time retreat in, the in a one cabin in the Colorado Rockies and then out. How long were you in Lone Pine? Ten months. Ten months in Lone Pine, total seclusion. And now in this cabin at 8,500 feet, she's going back in January to retreat, continue to retreat there. And I've been her guide there in her meditation retreat. And seeing her dedication, her renunciation, her utter commitment to Dharma, having finished, number one, just by the way, she started her professional career when she was 16 as a professionally trained ballet dancer with the New York City Ballet. She maxed out at 16. And then she did that and fell and got, I don't know, decided, how about a change of pace? And then she danced for a year for the, for the Royal Ballet in London. And then the ripe old age of 25, she saw, hey, I think I'm going to leave the palace. <laughs> At 25, she retired from a very successful career and went on to get a master's degree in Christian theology, applying Madhyamaka philosophy to Christian doctrine. That was breaking new ground. 
And, and then she went on, she wasn't satisfied. And then she went on and, and did a doctorate at the University of Virginia in Tibetan Buddhist studies, focusing on Tsongkhapa's teachings on emptiness and how they relate to Gwe Samaja Tantra. And her dissertation was 800 pages? Pretty good. And then, and then instead of pursuing what would undoubtedly have been a very successful ac academic career, with a master's in Christian theology, a PhD in Tibetan Buddhist studies of a very high caliber, then she just turned her back on and that she left the palace again. And she's been in retreat ever since then, just coming out to spend some time with her family. And so I've given basically all my guidance from afar. I'm 7,000 miles away and 1,000 miles away, but helping her, assisting her as I can in a retreat. And she will be continuing. She's, as I said, coming up like a whale here for a couple of weeks, visit her family, and then right back to the highlands where there's no electricity and no water and no heating at 8,500 feet in Colorado. And so um, she's going through her austerities right now, except not right here, but back then. So this is, this is Eva Natanya. This is her given name. Uh, her Dharma name is Yangchen. It's Tibetan translation of Sarasvati emanation of enlightened wisdom in the feminine form of learning, of music, of poetry, of literature. Does that pretty well do it? Yeah, kind of like that? She's Yang Jin. So if you'd like to call her by her Dharma name, that would be very suitable. Yang Chen, easy, Yang Chen. Dharma name, why not? She's, here's a Dharma teacher. Or if you just like Eva Natanya, fine, that's just hunky dory. I think I've done. Is that do it? This is Eva. Sorry, back on this sound, good. It's good to meet you all. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been on a stage, so this is kind of interesting. Mm. So the way these sessions, these afternoon sessions will go, uh, and I think on the schedule, it said 3.50, right? Do you, think, do you all feel like you could have been back easily by 3.50? So yeah, tomorrow we'll, we'll start this session at 3.50, um, of course, depending on when Lama Allen finish, finishes around 3.30. Uh, so the way this session will go is that I'll give a little talk very much, I hope, related to whatever the day's teaching has been. I've been making notes based on what I hear, what, it's, what it uh, brings up in me, and so it'll be very spontaneous. Uh, I don't have anything actually planned for the week. It'll go day by day according to the way the teaching's unfolding. Uh, we'll do another session, another meditation session. Um, I tend not, not to guide meditations according to the 24 minutes per se, uh, so maybe we'll be a little more flexible in the length uh, of the, the meditation session. Uh, and then a question and answer. So please do, as you're listening to Lama Allen, to me, feel free to make notes of your questions. Uh, we, should, we can probably have a box if you feel more comfortable writing your questions out um, that we'll collect in a box, but I'll also, uh, hopefully we can have a show of hands and then run the microphone around. Uh, and it's nice we have this many days uh, that things can percolate and you may not have a question today, but by Thursday you will. Uh, so I really hope we can get to all of that. Um, and the questions will keep evolving as the retreat goes on, of course. So, where it seems most appropriate to begin today uh, is the very question, as the theme has been of hedonia, eudaimonia, and what happens when one makes the decision to go into a retreat, whether it be of a day, a week, a month, or then a more long-term retreat. Because as we know, and I'm sure many of you have practiced meditation uh, in some fashion. Does, is, that, is that a proper uh, conjecture that we've all practiced meditation to some degree? Um, but we know how coming back to any kind of daily practice 
you're always re-filtering everything that's happened in the course of a day. Uh, whereas what retreat affords, as I say, whether it be of one day, three days a week, a month, and so on, is a continuity where you're not, in a way, going back to zero with your mind because you're still dealing with everything that happened in the 24 hours since your, or the 23 hours since your last meditation. Uh, and so with shamatha in particular, because it is such an, developing such an intimate relationship with what's coming up in your mind, and because so much of what's coming up in our mind is related to what's happening to us in our daily lives, the withdrawal of retreat quite directly involves cutting out the stimuli. And as Lama Allen has already said, not because those stimuli are necessarily bad, uh, but once one has an aspiration, a genuine aspiration to follow the path of shamatha as far as one can, ideally to its, to its conclusion, as, as you've already heard, there is such a thing as achieving shamatha. It doesn't mean you stop meditating, it means you then have a platform from which you can always uh, continue in practice and it's like the quantum leap to a whole new level of uh, meditation ability, attentional ability. But it takes a kind of intensive trajectory to even reach that platform, much like the medical degree analogy. And so the ideal of any kind of retreat is to have a sustained period in which one can start to gain the continuity and not lots of extra stimulation. Um, because as long as we're receiving the outer stimulation, our mind is still processing that content. And there, that's just the tip of the iceberg of our mind. And as long as we're processing new content every single day, you'll never get below a certain level and so what retreat starts to afford is as the stimulation thins out, and of course it takes quite, retreat often begins months before a retreat because you start preparing the ability to draw that circle around yourself, that boundary around yourself, whether it be physical by going up in the mountains as I have, or it be in your own home, but you are able to take that amount of time off by not having, having your phone off, having your computer off, um, not needing to attend to things in one's outer world. And for so many people, it takes quite a lot of effort just to carve that out for a weekend, much less a longer period. Uh, but the value of that, the incentive for that, is to create a space in which you start to see what happens to your mind when it's not engaging. And we can think we're not that interested in hedonic pleasures. We can think, yeah, I'm kind of over most of that. And I think most of you are here because there's already been a degree of recognition that the stimuli in the world aren't going to satisfy me or ultimately satisfy me. But one of the great challenges I personally have found in retreat, and I had done quite a bit of shorter retreat work before I began full-time, turned my whole life into a retreat, essentially. Uh, I had done ooh, any number, um, probably six to eight one-month retreats or six-week retre uh, six retreats. Um, so I thought I knew what a retreat was like. But I wish to share from a very personal, first-person perspective, the layers that I have started to discover about the retreat process where you are peeling away and peeling away and peeling away. And one almost has to get to the place where lack of stimulation is the norm to even be able to look into the depths of this thing we call our minds, this ocean of possibilities, memories, uh, fears, mental afflictions, hopes, desires, and so on. 
And to actually get a taste, uh, just toward the end, I think uh, Lama Ellen made reference to that image of a thought coming up like a bubble in, a, in an aquarium. Well, it takes a long time on the path of shamatha before it looks that simple. But for certain periods, it looks like you're in the Pacific Ocean in the middle of a hurricane. Whoosh! And the, the intensity of the things that are arising from one's mind stream that frankly make ordinary life in the world seem like a piece of cake. Because we think our lives are busy, we think our lives are full. Um, but we're actually, by this age, and I can include all the ages of everyone here, we've learned how to cope. We have learned how to cope with our outer worlds pretty well. But to see the possibilities for instability that lurk within our mind and to learn how to deal with that before we can get to the depths of stability is something I think, no matter how much I'd heard about, I couldn't really anticipate. Couldn't really anticipate how long that process could be. And so I speak this now, not in, at all to scare you, only to encourage you, because it is sublimely worthwhile as a process, because you start to see those resources of refuge that we all carry with us. Because, and I know you're coming from many different backgrounds, but to understand refuge, perhaps as it's defined in Buddhism, but not limited to Buddhism, uh, is to start to see that that refuge, the enlightened mind that is omniscient and omnipresent, there's nowhere the Buddha is not. There's nowhere the omniscient awareness is not already present. They say the speed of thought when we call upon uh, the enlightened activity, the Buddha's the speed of thought, they come to us. Well, it's actually faster than that because the awareness was aware of our prayer before we even could verbalize it within our minds. Uh, to even try to imagine what enlightened awareness that permeates all things, all mind streams, is seeing everything perfectly as it is now, then can we take refuge that there is a compassionate, enlightened awareness that sees every single thing we're experiencing it as we're experiencing it, but not with, not, not stuck in the perspective that we have a transcendent perspective that is, at the same time, imminent to our experience. And if we can take refuge in that, and know that it's not far away, know that it is more interior to us than our own cabin, than our own bodies, the joy of the refuge surpasses even the tsunamis and the hurricanes that are coming up from within one's own mind and to realize that this incredibly intense uh, battle sometimes, and there's a reason they call it the battle with the Maras or the demons or just plain our mental afflictions, that battle, the stage of that battle can all happen while you just didn't go anywhere. And uh, it makes refuge very, very strong because you know you don't actually have any other refuge than the innermost ground, the innermost source, the innermost uh, compassion that is both looking upon you, but then you start to realize more and more, oh, that's within me. How could I experience that kind of compassion if it wasn't welling up from within me? Uh, so I don't want to go on too long now before our meditation, but just this point that, mm, Mama Ellen raised and then commented, we did discuss it during the lunch break. Just how far does the definition of hedonia as stimulus-driven pleasure uh, go? Because we do know that there are, as, as Lama Ellen mentioned, there are any number of genuine, deep, transformative spiritual practices that involve sensory or mental stimulation. 
Uh, and ritual practice, of course, in the Tibetan tradition, Vajrayana ritual is supposed su precisely designed to transform our relationship with the objects of the senses. So there's it's no accident that rituals are very elaborate and sensorily uh, elaborate. Making offerings, I've often reflected on this, the, the irony, you're in retreat, you're putting effort into making physical offerings on an altar, and if you really r recognize that the Buddhas aren't anywhere else, you say, who's actually enjoying these offerings? <laughs> I am. And, uh, and I think there's, there's a hidden wisdom to that. We're supposed to go through that process of asking, why am I making these outer physical offerings? And I, I, that's a long topic, which I won't go into now. Uh, but the, the point right now, the theme right now, is, is why are we doing these rituals with, with outer objects of the senses? And then, of course, as is mentioned in this very last quotation, um, as something to be set aside, while settling body, speech, and mind is without engaging any thoughts, uh, sorry. Settle the mind evenly without engaging in any good thoughts such as deity meditation. That's precisely saying at this stage of settling body, speech, and mind in preparation for shamatha practice, don't engage in your visualizations and your vajrayana practice. Uh, and that's coming from straight within the tradition where everybody's practicing that. So they're making the distinction between what happens when you are actively conjuring images, conjuring transformations, conjuring sequence in your meditation, and that's still activating a part of the conceptual mind, which for this particular method of settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states, that too has to be set aside. And so I... I think I leave this as a, as a question for all of us. To what degree can our, the stimulation we receive from our spiritual practice still trigger in us a grasping to hedonic pleasure? So this is subtle. This is not just about defining, well, what's hedonic, what's eudaimonic. As Lama Allen says, we can make up whatever definitions we want. It's a, it's a matter of their usefulness. It's a matter of their eff how efficacious those definitions are in helping us in our path, especially in, in this case where one's taking two Greek terms and now using them in the context of Buddhist meditation practice. Uh, but what I have found to be extremely meaningful is to notice in the path of shamatha how many things one's attached to even within the spiritual path. And that's not necessarily a matter of sensory stimulation, it's also the mental stimulation of visualizations, of reciting a liturgy, of imagining the beauty of the guru. In Tuscany this past spring, I was asked to, to teach on a guru yoga, the shower of blessings. Uh, and as some of you who are there know, it's a rich, gorgeous, satisfying, emotionally intense practice. Uh, it's not saying don't do that, just as we're not saying don't eat or don't um, look at the mountains. But to recognize when our mind is being stimulated and when it's not, is essential to the path of shamatha. Because even if one were taking as one's object of single-pointed concentration, a visualized image, which is very traditional in Tibetan tradition, Lama Allen will not be teaching that this week, but if one were to take an image of Shakyamuni Buddha, for example, so, such as this here, uh, and visualize that, and you get finer and finer and finer in the detail of one's visualization, there's still pleasure that is arising because of that mentally gen generated image. And Lama Allen and I have been having a little bit of a debate about this of, well, is that hedonic or eudaimonic? It's coming from your mind. It's through the discipline of sustaining, sustaining, sustaining this image. But it's not just awareness itself. And it's not just neutral like the sensations of the breath. It has a quality in which something is coming from the image which your own mind created, which is still sustaining you. And I don't think there's an answer to that. I think it's just something for us to recognize 
there's a very fine line here. Uh, and I guess my heart's message at the moment is simply for us all to become more sensitive to where we're deriving not just pleasure, not even just stimulation, but our satisfaction, hour to hour, day to day. Because what a, an environment of deep retreat forces one to recognize is how dependent we are on those stimuli. And it may not be a movie, and it may not be a busy city street, or it may not be a restaurant. It's whatever our mind can come up with. And what you start to see when um, you're more and more aware of the kinds of thoughts that are bubbling up, as, as Rama Allen mentioned the very uh, last point about set settling the mind as natural state, and we'll spend a lot of time on that this week, and you start to see sometimes the random array of thoughts that will co be coming up, whether one is taking as one's object uh, mindfulness of breathing, or a different uh, practice such as settling the mind in its natural state as one's main shamatha practice. And I'm jumping ahead a bit, so don't worry if, if you don't know exactly what that means yet. Um, but at any rate, the, the experience of watching thoughts arise and not, not thinking them, observing one's thoughts but not thinking one's thoughts, you can get more of a, more of a taste of how the mind is addicted to thinking. And for me personally, that's become more and more bizarre sometimes because I've recognized the degree to which I don't want to be engaging with anything but the simplicity. You get these tastes, you get these beautiful tastes of the simplicity of awareness, the simplicity of the sensations of the breath, which are neutral, but when you're deep, that's all you want to experience. You really don't want to be experiencing anything else. But what part of the mind is still not satisfied? So it comes up with something else to think. And it throws something more into the space of awareness. Uh, so we are actually walking around, we are walking contradictions. And sometimes we don't realize that until we have enough withdrawal uh, sensory withdrawal to be in a state of retreat, as they say, whether a weekend or uh, longer. And so part of our preparation to be good soldiers, to be ready to go into this sublime, divine battle uh, to purify our minds, it's a marvelous first step just to start to become aware of our addictions that we would never call addictions in the normal terminology of the world. They're subtle, they're subtle already. Um, and so then coming back to refuge, as we strip those addictions and realize that that refuge never moved, it was always there. The simplicity of the refuge in contradistinction to the complexity of our minds. Then it becomes very visceral, this difference between what's stimulation and what's non-stimulated ground state awareness that's always there. And it's so quiet. So I think we will do another session uh, now specifically on settling the mind in its natural state. Uh, I'm sorry, settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states. Um, because as I think Lama Allen intimated and he will probably say more about, this practice is the beginning, middle, and end of all practices. Our body, speech, and mind will be perfectly settled in their natural states only when we become a Buddha. And we find out what it means to have a body that can emanate on countless planets. And we find out what it means to have a speech 
that naturally emerges as mantra as the teachings needed for any disciples anywhere. And we'll find out what it is to have a mind settled in its natural state when it is the pure, clear light mind of the Dharmakaya. So you taste how vast these, these ideas of settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states can be. And that's why the word nilnjor, joining oneself to the ground state, uh, is such a profound term and um, process. But one, again, point that I wish to express from the experience that I've, experiences that I've been in in the last two and a half years in particular is how long and how cyclical this process of settling body, speech, and mind can be. Um, I love the story that Lama Allen related of a, a practitioner who came to him after seven weeks and said, ah, finally, I figured out what it means not to try to control my own breath. But that's actually just the first step, discovering what it is to truly let the breath settle itself without control. That doesn't mean one has yet reached that very fine, subtle, shallow, inaudible, smooth breath rhythm that Alan described. That could take years. That could take years in full-time retreat. And it's beautiful and it's so humbling to realize that the very process of settling the speech in its natural state in particular because the speech being intimately related with the breath means the whole practice of mindfulness of breathing is a process of settling the breath in its natural state the speech in its natural state and to realize how intimately connected to our psychological state that is and so as the depths of our psychological messes are dredged up and we face more and more layers of ourselves that we didn't even know were there, it keeps affecting the breath again. It keeps affecting, even if we're totally silent, it's affecting the breath. And so I offer you ah, the perseverance, the courage. Don't think it's going to happen in a one-month retreat. And don't think that a six-month retreat was useless if one's breath is still helter-skelter. It's a long, long process. And it's precisely the patience to follow the transformation of one's own heart and mind and body through this very simple, simple practice of settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states um, that can take us all the way to shamatha, all the way to enlightenment if we're willing to give it the time. And if we're willing not to pin our self-worth on how fast our body, speech, and mind are settling in their natural states, because I hate to say it, that's a really nasty temptation for a retreat meditator to pin their self-worth on the quality of meditation as this coarse mind judges it. <laughs> you, you can picture what I mean, right? Because we're so used to, it's not just hedonic stimulation, it's also hedonic self-worth, that we are who we are because of the way we engage. And so not only are you not having stimulation in deep retreat, you also don't have an identity. And that's the cool part, that's the fantastic part, because it gives us the freedom to become something infinitely greater, something infinitely more meaningful. Uh, but there's that, there are those layers of personality which don't feel comfortable not being anybody. And so again, the schizophrenia of, well, I really did want to be in retreat. I really didn't want to be any of the other things I'm not doing now, but I'm not anybody else either, so who am I? And then that's when the demons love to <laughs> have, a, have a party. Um, but the patience to let this process of settling body, speech, and mind go through its cycles again and again and again, and each time is a little bit different, but you feel like you're right way back where you were, and you realize that you can't even trust your mind anymore, like the surface level of the mind, because it's going forward and back and forward and back. 
This practice, this simple first step practice is the way to let that go over and over and over again. To be utterly at peace with oneself when all you have to do in the world is settle your body, speech, and mind in their natural states. And then it's through the intensity and instability of that, what seems like an instability of that process, that we can start letting go all the identities, all the thoughts, all the attachment to trying to measure ourselves that can open up the doorway and the, the uh, I want to say that it's like a, the hole in a lens and you start to see into that infinite depth uh, that, as I say, was always there. But it's the surrender and the letting go and only through that surrender and letting go that we can actually taste that stillness. Because as long as we are trying to put our, our own mm, striving on top of our practice, that's just like putting a, a, a clamping jaw on top of lace. You don't pick up lace with a, with a metal claw. It has to be very, very gentle. Uh, so I think I've said enough for now. Let's meditate. Um, as I said, I'm not really good at the 24-minute thing. <laughs> um, so I think we'll just be a bit freeform. Uh, And I'll just do it verbally when we, when we start and when we finish. So find what you think to begin with as a comfortable posture. And then like letting your body weight sink into the earth, drop off everything you think you're holding. Let your spine be like a plumb line dropping the weight of an anchor deep, deep into the earth. And take time experiencing the earth element. And all the points of contact between your body and the ground. But as you do so, you'll already be aware of an undulation if you've been practicing this for a long time, you may already associate that undulation with the rhythm of the breath. But it may also seem to have a life of its own, like 
swirls and eddies of energy in your toes, in your legs, in your hands. And so, because we are first settling the body in its natural state, don't worry about the breath at all. You're not following the breath right now. Just let the body be and watch it carefully. How the weight is aligning itself. And you may make a few adjustments as you realize the back is not as aligned as it could be. It's not about being straight, it's about being aligned and everyone's body is different. But very gradually let your awareness move upward from the legs, the hips, into your torso. Gently observing. Not trying to make a perfect posture. Just letting yourself be as simple as possible. If you're sitting upright, you may feel as though your arms are two waterfalls, the energy cascading down your arms to where your hands are joined. If you're lying in Shavasana, you may feel that pouring down your arms and letting the energy pass out through your fingertips. What we're observing now is prana. It's energy that's moving through the body all the time. It coagulates it. At its most coarse level, it becomes the elements of earth and actual liqui liquidity in the body, the heat of the body, the breath, the air. But right now, because we're tasting this non-conceptual space, don't try to label it, just feel. Feel sensations that aren't usually so easy to feel. Let them be. And then feel how your head is placed. Is there space around your neck? gentleness, openness. Be sure there's no tension held in your neck. For some of us, there may always be a lot of energy running around in the head. can deliberately let that pour out of your eyes, relaxing the muscles behind your eyes. start to taste the 
passage of the breath through your nostrils or through your mouth. The relaxation is so deep right now. We're not trying to make anything. Anything that it's not. If you're comfortable breathing out through your mouth, let it be. Let the breath release all the way. Not pushing it out, just letting it fall out. the way water falls from a glass that's put on its side. And then let your whole body breathe in. Receiving gratefully the gift of breath. with no expectation of a rhythm. Simply watch the breath release itself and receive itself. Letting the mind be as quiet as possible so as not to miss a moment of this sublimely miraculous process. of simply breathing. And then when you're ready, as we pass into settling the mind in its natural state, allow your eyes to open. Gently, not looking up, just letting them rest. Not focusing on anything. and begin to become aware of this very fact of being aware. So utterly simple. And thoughts will arise just as sounds arise, just as colors appear to your eyes. But you're not concerned with any of that. You're just dwelling. 
in the simplicity of being aware. And if you start to feel a little dull, it's late in the afternoon, it's warm. Ever so gently brighten your awareness of being aware. It's like turning the lights up from a dimmer switch. You're not contracting, you're not withdrawing, you're just brightening your awareness without tightening, without creating tension anywhere, just brightening. And then releasing Be sure that nothing is contracted. As you feel the breath continuing to flow out, let your mind flow out with it. Know that your awareness is not limited to anywhere in your body. It encompasses everything of which you are aware. So as sounds come in, as your mental picture of the room around you arises, recognize your awareness is that broad, that spacious. without doing anything to it. And if you feel discomfort, agitation, the urge to move, try relaxing more deeply. Learning to anticipate that urge to adjust and instead just letting your energy melt. Melt around the pain, melt around the itch, melt around the discomfort. But before that melting could turn into sleepiness, return to the clarity, the vigilance.
the breadth and spaciousness of awareness. And returning to the experience of your posture. Feel the rootedness of your stability. Just by being still. Notice again the continuity of your breath. The fact your awareness can keep encompassing that rhythm of the breath, knowing it without changing it, without controlling it. Return to the simplicity of your awareness. Letting th thoughts flow like the dog let off its leash. Not controlling the thoughts any more than the breath, but not following them either. Not identifying with them. And since all of this is still just a preliminary, we'll venture for a few minutes into the main shamatha practice we've learned already today. Mindfulness of breathing. And so return to the awareness of the flow of prana within your body, but now focusing specifically on the sensations associated with the rhythm of the breath. You're aware of the rhythm of the breath already. You're aware of sensations as you settled your body in its natural state. Now try to find those sensations that are specifically changing according to the rhythm of the breath throughout your whole body. The awareness is still. The awareness takes in your whole body at once. You're not following the breath. You're observing it. All of a piece.
then as we come to the end of 24 minutes, check in how your state of mind differs from the beginning of the session or even from a few minutes ago. Are you sleepier? Are you brighter? Is there more on your mind, less on your mind? There are no right answers, just check. How has your body adjusted? Are you still in the same posture you started in? How has your breathing changed? It's very important to end each session the best we can not only because it will help us want to return, but also because it helps plant the seed, the imprint for how we want to start our next meditation. So if at all possible, even if we were falling asleep completely, it's important to brighten just at the end of a session so that you, you want to go back there and you, you kind of forget about all the in-between things. So drawing together your current understanding of settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states. And then this sustainable practice of mindfulness of breathing spread throughout the whole body. Just check in and try to crystallize your best understanding from today all of it together. And each of you, when you're ready, will close the session. So we, so we have about half an hour left for, question, for questions, uh, and hopefully someone already has some things in mind. Yeah, oh, wonderful, thank you. Any questions coming up yet? Yes, please, Brenton. Hi, my name is Brenton. Um, thank you for the, the meditation, the teaching, it was amazing. <laughs> so my question is about the, um, what you brought up, what, what Lama brought up today about if you do a visualization, that's like a hedonic practice. Mm -hmm. um, so, my, um, so my take is hedonia is what you get from the world and eudaimonia is what, what you give to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, So my qualm is if you're doing like a a Chen Rizzi practice with a mm -hmm. Bodhisattva motivation, and that's giving compassion to sentient beings, how, how is it in the category of hedonia? So I've got a big qualm with that one. Um, I, I've got an issue with, not an issue, but like, yeah, it's, it's very subtle, isn't it, like you said, so. My, like, my interpretation, could there be like a dependent arising eudaimonia, not, not in the same categories, like to me, being the same spectrum as Hedonia doesn't doesn't sound right for me, but maybe I'm lacking understanding, or I don't know. This, um, is, ex <laughs> this is exactly the yeah, right, the yeah. discussion yeah, that yeah, so you, you did talk about, but, but I'm still lacking a bit of clarity and yeah. certainty. Um, like I think it's actually something for us not to get too hung up on, um, because certainly in my conversation with Lama Allen about it, uh, and that didn't start today; that started some time ago. Um, First of all, to clarify, as he said earlier, 
he's not using the word hedonic in a negative or pejorative sense. It's mm -hmm. simply the understanding that there is some stimulus, that when that stimulus stops, the pleasure or even joy that is coming from the stimulus will also stop. And so the, the argument that he, he would give in the, exactly the case of a loving kindness meditation, of the Kiteshvara, if there's a visualization, or if you are focusing upon sentient beings and experiencing the joy of the loving kindness that's pouring out of you, is a very moot point. If you stopped that meditation, the pleasure that was arising from it would also stop in that moment. But for those of you who are here, on, uh, who are at the Vajrayana Institute on Saturday night, uh, Lama Allen very clearly said, if you tell a child the pleasure you give from giving a gift yeah, exactly. is eudaimoniac. And so like, how could that be different from the pleasure one derives from a uh, Tenrizig meditation where you're sending love and kindness out to all beings? So it's a moot point. I will, personally, that's, that's my opinion. It's a very moot point. For me right now, and I hope I'll keep asking the question, the takeaway is in the achievement of shamatha, and this is important, even if one has been taking as one's object the visualization of a Buddha image, or one has been taking as one's object loving kindness, Early in the practice of loving kindness, one is definitely bringing to mind individual living beings and directing one lo one's loving kindness toward them. We'll probably speak more about the four immeasurables this week. Um, but there is definitely a stage in which that practice of wishing upon living beings that which we they want is directed at individual uh, objects, and one has to use that word, it doesn't sound right in English, but there is someone on the other end of the tra trajectory of your loving kindness. And many of you may be familiar with the idea of um, non-objective loving kindness, or loving kindness both that is directed at all sentient beings equally, but also that starts to understand their emptiness of inherent nature. And it's not time for me to go into that now. Uh, but there can be loving kindness that's not, that doesn't have little pictures of people at the end of the points of light, as it were. The loving kindness becomes so ubiquitous, so all-encompassing, that when you come out of that meditation, anybody you meet, oh, it's only working if that loving kindness comes toward that individual. But in the, from the point of view of the meditation, you're actually cultivating the subjective state of mind of loving kindness. And so if one were to reach shamatha with that practice, uh, in the end, it's the subjective state of mind, which would then dissolve into the, the substrate, as you know. Um, but you wouldn't have to keep raising the images of living beings to stimulate your loving kindness. And that, I think, is the key point. When one's reaching shamatha, actual shamatha, you don't need any stimulus, even something um, generated by your own mind, because it's the subjective state of mind that has so transformed uh, that the coarse mind is then able to dissolve into the subtle mind, and you'll hear lots more about that this week. Um, so likewise with a mental image, uh, I believe the source is Tsongkhapa, actually. Uh, Lama Allen wrote about this in his dissertation, which is published as Balancing the Mind. If you've used a visualized image as your object of shamatha, when you're actually about to reach shamatha, you can dissolve that image. Because it's, the cla it's the, these three qualities of the non-conceptuality, the bliss, the lucidity of, of the state of mind that takes you into sh actual shamatha. So again, these are details I'm, I'm kind of having to jump ahead. You'll hear all of this in much more detail this week. Uh, so don't worry if it's not clear. But on this very meaningful point of how do we know when we're still stimulating and when we're starting to tap into that endless source, that the artesian well source of happiness uh, that won't rely upon the trigger, I think that's one place to think about it 
is, well, what, what would happen if I access the state of mind that will be an everlasting, or, or well, even the subject of consciousness isn't, isn't an everlasting source of happiness. We know that. Uh, one has to go deeper than that to reach the true artesian well of happiness. But at the relative level, what would it be to access a state of mind that is producing bliss, luminosity, non-conceptuality without having to trigger an image or, or even an object of loving kindness? But the loving kindness could be there as the subjective state of mind. Is that a little bit clear? So the, my other point is, so for a beginner, the images are like training wheels, is that right? For, for a beginner doing loving kind, so it can like be training, like a, yeah. Like training wheels, yes. Yeah. yeah, in a sense. Profound training wheels. Very, very meaningful training wheels. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And of course, in the stage of generation, every single detail of the visualization has profound reasons, has profound um, uh, there seem to be like the seeds for all the qualities of enlightenment. So there's nothing trivial about every single detail of a mandala in the stage of generation that one is visualizing. But this is one, and this actually was the core of the point I wanted to make tonight, so thank you for, for taking me back to it. And I know many of you here may not be practicing the stage of generation in Buddhist Vajrayana, but some of you may be. And this is sponsored by the Vajrayana Institute, so in honor of, of the core of Ajayana practice. I think the key point is that if one comes to the stage of generation and tries to make it one's full-on main practice, as in doing a three-year retreat or extensive mantra retreats, without the mind being deeply purified by the practice of shamatha, how easy is it to turn the stage of generation into a hedonic pleasure? It doesn't have to be, because at the subtler, subtler levels, as I say, it becomes a really moot point. If you've visualized that mandala so many times that it arises in a single instant and you can see, for example, all um, 32, days, 32 deities of the Great Samaja Mandala uh, arise and can stay for up to a minute, which is the first milestone in Lama Tsongkhapa's description of true deity practice in the Great Samaja Mandala, the meditative power it takes to be able to sustain that, I, do, I couldn't call that hedonic pleasure. Because once you're there, that is arising from your mind. You see it arising from your mind. You are dwelling in the natural qualities, creative power of your mind at its deepest level. But as many of you have heard Lama Allen repeat over and over again, um, the dangers of trying to devote oneself 100% to stage of generation practice without due preparation in shamatha, the danger is that we bring all our human neuroses to it. We bring our attachments. We bring maybe a quite limited understanding of emptiness, a quite limited experience of bodhicitta. And so then the possibilities for developing attachments to that practice the way we would for stimuli out in the world. It's a big danger. Uh, and the practices, as I said, are designed precisely in order to transform our relationship to the objects of the senses and the objects of our mental attachment and attraction. Um, but one needs a very well-trained mind. And the beauty of shamatha practices, such as we will be focusing on this week, which are so raw, so simple, that you're not generating anything new in the mind. The breath is al already there. We can't get rid of it. We hope we won't get rid of it. <laughs> uh, we're not generating anything that's not there. And developing the stability, clarity, ease of attention on those kinds of, we can still say, objects of meditation, objects of attention. Um, it trains the mind not to need all the other things in our habitual way. And as I started to express, that's not an easy process, but it's a sublimely worthwhile process. And the mind trained in that, which has 
perhaps been able to reach shamatha or very close according to these methods? Maybe mindfulness of breathing, maybe settling the mind in its natural state, maybe awareness of awareness. Then take that mind into a Vajrayana mandala. The likelihood of developing afflicted attachment to the object of meditation, it's, it's just you've, because you've, um, you've done so much work in shattering the uh, obscurations, the five obscurations. And the jhana factors are so strong that you're ready to engage with those powerful objects of meditation in the stage of generation without taking it as a hedonic pleasure. Does that make sense? I hope that's helpful to at yes, least some of you. I have a bit more clarity. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I, I have more clarity. Okay. Yeah, it's clearer. Thank you. Good. Someone else? Yes, here. Thank you. Uh, just bringing it back to the basics a little. Um, just eyes open or eyes closed uh, when you meditate. I always been I've always closed my eyes, but just recently I'm shifting a bit. Only because particularly if I meditate in the evening, the images seem to be um, go to a certain level where I want to then open my eyes a little to to prevent uh, those kind of distractions. So I was just w wondering whether that shifting is probably not the best way to go or is it just each to their own? This is a wonderful question. I think we've all dealt with it at some level and it's something I still, mm, I won't say struggle with, but it's, it's an ongoing question. Uh, in general, my understanding is that Mindfulness of breathing, it doesn't matter whether the eyes are open or closed. Uh, and there's a phrase that you'll probably hear Lama Allen say this week called um, hooded. And what I believe, and I need to check this with him, but what I've always thought he means by that is your lids are down far enough that you're not seeing identifiable objects, but they're up just enough that light can come in. And is that familiar to everybody? You've all tried that, and, you, and it, it depends a lot on the amount of light in the room, but in sort of a gentle light like this, you can get to a place where nothing's actually coming into focus. And it probably looks to all of you like my eyes are closed, but there's just a, a bit of light. And the deeper one goes into meditation, the lid may not go all the way shut, but there's still the... Uh, energy of light coming in, and that's very helpful for, for staying awake. So that can be perfect for mindfulness of breathing. Uh, Tibetans in general do not encourage closing the eyes all the way, mostly because it's a lot easier to get sleepy. Um, but the most important thing is that there not be tension. That the, and this is something we like settling body, speech, and mind. Settling eyes in their natural state is a process that can take years also. I have not heard anyone s use that phrase, so I think I can say we can we coined a new term tonight: settling eyes in their natural state. Uh, it's another process. Personally, there are times in retreat because of th things that I've been dealing with energetically, when I try to open my eyes and I can't. I'm saying if I stop the meditation, I could, but the the way that the energy is moving, it feels like it's just a weight on the eyes. Um, and I've learned I just have to be patient with that uh, and let it be. And sometimes 20 minutes later, an hour later, that pressure will release and the lids will open easily. And then I can do, as, as we just did now, mm -hmm. eyes gently open and, and very proper for the instructions on settling the mind in its natural state. So that may not be, be your experience, but I, wanted, I had wanted to say it. So, um, and it's relevant, I think, for, for all of us in this question. In terms of instruction for mindfulness of breathing, open or close, no problem, whatever you like, whatever feels most comfortable to you. Settling the mind in its natural state, whether it's in the context of this preliminary practice or if it's later on, you'll definitely hear Lama Allen say, for this, let your eyes be partially open. Uh, or just gently, relaxedly open. But I can see 
everything that's right in front of me. Not, oh, I can see the ceiling, but I can see everything that's right in front of me. Um, so it depends sometimes on the practice. And certainly for practices that are direct preliminaries to Dzogchen, the, the one not has to practice having the eyes open. It's very important for the spaciousness of awareness and not making any, any demarcation between the inside of my body and the outside of my body. One has to have the porousness of the eyes, and then the eyes become very, very important in, in advanced Dzogchen practices such as Tugel. Uh, I think I heard you say something about images coming up at night. Yes. Is that a sense of drowsiness, like you're, the, the mind is tired and you're starting to get random images arising? Uh, maybe. Um, you know, it, it does happen more in the, in the evening, so I guess uh, that makes sense if that's where it's coming from. But it's just, and uh, maybe it's just the course of the day mm -hmm. um, has accelerated that right. in some way. Yeah, I'm not sure is what, it, where it comes from. Is it, comes from. is it a kind of a random sequence of Im images that, have not, that are unrelated to each other? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a very common phenomenon. It's called hypnagogic imagery. And it, it can happen on the edge of sleep. But it's different from dreams uh, in that there's no storyline. It's not where a full-on dream where somehow you are instantiated as a character in the dream and there's a storyline of some kind, no matter how confused. The notion of the hypnagogic imagery, which is very common, for meditators who are struggling with, with drowsiness. And probably all of us will have experienced it at some point. It's totally normal, nothing to worry about. Um, but those images are arising because the mind is starting to descend into a sleep state. But because you're cultivating meditation, you're more vividly aware of it. And you're, you're actually keeping yourself from going all the way into the sleep state. Does that sound a little bit familiar? Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. So, of course, my first advice would be try to get more sleep. That's, we, we all need it. We all need it. And if that is happening repeatedly, it is a sign that you're, you're probably meditating either at a time of day when you simply don't have enough mental energy to give it your best. And we've all dealt with that. There's nothing wrong. It's just we've all dealt with it. Um, and if you... Are you meditating morning and night, or is that your main meditation Yes, time? both. And, and it's, uh, in the morning, it's the eyes closed, and it, and it feels, yeah, there's, there's a lot of peace that comes with it, and there's less distraction. But so it's the night time where mm -hmm. uh, all this activity... Yes, and it, because your mind is processing the day also. Uh, so that is a time that if you can be in a, in a lit room, not necessarily brightly lit, but, and not a candle that's flickering, but just a lit room so that you're not falling into that, the darkness of that world and the images are just knocking each other out. Um, so having the eyes slightly open, I, I agree, I've had the experience that just opening the eyes stops those images from coming. Um, but de again, depending on your practice, if you're practicing settling the mind in its natural state, simply honing your awareness as those Im images arise is, is a beneficial practice. It will break through that dullness eventually. Um, and so keeping the clarity of the awareness, if you start getting finer and finer in identifying split-second images, that's making progress. That is, that is practicing. Uh, and it's not something to blame yourself that I'm getting dream images. No, just let your awareness become brighter. Because uh, you're not trying to stop the images. If your practice is settling the mind in its natural state, if you're doing mindfulness of breathing, then you would increase the subtle, the, the sensitivity of your awareness of the tactile sensations. It's a very different technique. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That's um, good. And, and again, you could open your eyes in both cases if it helps you to stay awake. Uh, but if then opening your eyes, if you're practicing mindfulness of breathing, and opening your eyes distracts you to visual, the visual field rather than tactile sensations, then that might be unhelpful as well. And so whatever enables you to hone your awareness on the tactile sensation is, is the most beneficial in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, good. Um, 
One or two more. Hello, um, my name is Jody. Um, my understanding is when you're doing uh, shamatha with breathing, there's a way in which um, you can do it in which you have, you know, the sense of self behind your eyes um, following the object and so there's a sort of clear subject object thing going on. And I've heard some meditation teachers allude to the idea of uh, a more non-dual approach where uh, uh, the object of the breath, you don't necessarily have to, um, or any sensations that you're experiencing, you don't have to come up to verify with the mental manager up here and it, it's a different sort of experience that removes the subject object through a more expansive view of the self. And I get, I'm just wondering in practicing the settling the mind in its natural state and the shamatha with object, is there a preferred way to be practicing that? So as you may know, the, the question of a sense of self in Buddhism is a very complex one, and that's a separate subject really, is the analysis of where, where is the locus of me. Uh, but I think if you're having a, an experience of se sense of self and locating it behind the eyes, from a Buddhist perspective, that's just further reifying, further concretizing the very sense of self that most Buddhist practice is designed to, to uh, break through. So just as uh, you will hear Lama Allen say more, he hinted at it today, but you'll probably hear him say more, your awareness is not inside your head. And likewise, your sense of your set yourself is not inside your head. We sometimes have a sense of self inside our head by sheer habit, but that can be through the process of inquiry. We can um, explode that pretty easily. We can recognize that's that's just made up to locate a sense of self inside the head, uh, much less behind the eyes. So. Definitely in all the practices we've done today, uh, they're designed to fully embody at the tactile level, to let the awareness, as, as you may have heard uh, Alan use the phrase, let your awareness fill the space of your body as a fragrance fills a room. And it's a wonderful image he's been using for many years. Uh, imagine if someone brought in a very strong and, and delightful perfume how, and it came through that door, how it would eventually reach all ends of this room, if it was strong enough, if the, if the scent was strong enough. Small room, much easier. Um, so that's a kind of a mystery, uh, a question for us. What, what does it feel like to have awareness fill the entire space of the body? And I think that may be one reason why Alan starts mindfulness breathing with the full body breath, uh, what he calls a sangha's method, and not, um, just at the tips of the nostrils. To realize that you can have every bit as much awareness at the tip of your toe as at the tip of your nostrils. Uh, it's very important. And then what I was emphasizing just now is something that took me a long time to learn, which is when you're following the rhythm of the breath through the whole body, it's so tempting to want to go to follow it from your nose Somehow, oh, it's passing through me, and now it's going down to my toes, and now it's coming up again. And of course, breath itself only goes as far as the lungs. There are sensations, there are patterns of sensations that can be followed all the way to the legs, but it can set up a contradiction of, well, am I, have I lost the sensations in the upper part of my body while the sensations in the lower part of my body got stronger? Uh, and I, I have no easy answer to this because I've been working with it for a long time and I'm amazed at how uh, difficult it is to keep the awareness homogenous, the awareness homogeneously bright through the whole body even as the intensity of the sensations is changing and you're following a rhythm. But all of that is to say it is worthwhile, it is uh, beneficial to the practice 
to, if your if, uh, practice is mindfulness of breathing throughout the whole body, your awareness from the beginning covers the whole space of the body. Now, if your practice is settling the mind in its natural state, your awareness encompasses the space of the mind. And as we will soon discover, the space of the mind has no boundaries. So in any way to locate it could be just uh, an obstacle. It would be an obstacle. Um, there was more depth to your question uh, in terms of non-duality. In basic Buddhist psychology, uh, it, it's very clearly set out there's a subject state of mind and there's something that it's observing and that's an object. And there's no problem with that. That doesn't necessarily mean you're grasping to self-existence just to have a subject state of mind and an object. I think this just went out. I don't know if I need to say anything. Okay. Um, so there's nothing wrong to be able to identify this is awareness, this is the object of awareness. Um, and in fact, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> when settling the mind in its natural state as a full practice, if you fuse the awareness with any single thought, that's what you're not supposed to do because you've just fused with the thought and you're carried by the thought. So you need to keep the distance of awareness from that which it is observing so as not to fuse with anything that comes up, but to let it pass, let it self-release, let it dissolve. Um, and likewise with the breath, if you actually fused your awareness with any single sensation, then that might lead you to think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on that sensation, and then that passes away, and then where am I next? And you get the picture. It, it, it's a little problematic to say, try to be non-dual awareness and its object when we're starting shamatha. There is such a thing as an experience of non-duality, but that's, that's triggered by an understanding of the nature of reality, and it's reached through vipassana. Um, we won't necessarily get to it just from shamatha. Uh, so I think I kind of, I was trying to clarify both options that you gave me. No, we're not trying to locate a sense of self behind the eyes, or behind the heart even. It's a very lovely practice, and there are a lot of practices that help us to bring the awareness from its habitual location in the head to the heart, and that's very powerful. But we also don't want to get tight in the heart, and for these particular practices, we're not, we're not aiming on holding the awareness in the heart at all, so it's much more broader than that. Um, but also, we're not trying to fuse non-dually with the object yet. Um, the yet there is... There's a sense in which, as you get closer to single-pointed concentration, there's just no distraction, and so the awareness is so completely honing itself in to that one object, whatever it may be, and I don't want to pick one for now, that because everything else is dropping away, there's just one experience. But theoretically, prior to reaching shamatha, and certainly prior to reaching it, uh, ex realizing emptiness in any profound way, you haven't actually overcome, non overcome the experience of duality. Um, okay, that was my attempt. That's a very sophisticated question, and I, I hope that was helpful, but. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Um, one more, a quick one, or should we wait till tomorrow? We'll have more time. I think everybody's a bit tired. It's been a very full day. Uh, and I wish you a lovely evening. And sleep as much as you can. We all need it. Um, and it'll be hot tomorrow, so hopefully there will still be a breeze. So thank you very, very much. Um, and just briefly, in your own way, as, as you pack up and go out, let your heart dedicate all that you've experienced today, all you've thought about, all your efforts, the virtuous efforts we've made to practice together toward your own intention for this retreat. And maybe if you haven't fully examined yet, what is your intention for this retreat? As you go home, think, why did I come? And what am I seeking? Uh, and you've received a lot today about what are we seeking. And so let that question sit. Okay, so. See you tomorrow.